And when we when we first started looking at Aries One X and did this this lean event and reorganized, one of the things that came up would be let's make us a Tiger Team, a Skunk Works kind of approach. Get everyone together from upper stage and first stage in avionics, and just get in one area, in one city, and work it through that way. And that is absolutely the ideal way to do it. That would have been the best way to go do it. Um, but we, we didn't, and because we felt that we couldn't practically do that. Um, people were making the upper stage at Glenn Research Center. It was physically being made there. I wanted those people where their hardware was being made. Um, people were physically making the command module launch abort system at Langley Research Center. I wanted those people around where their hardware was being made. They can touch it, and they can understand what the problems are and talk to their technicians real time. So while it's good to have everyone together from a management point of view and even from an engineering point of view in one city, when you pull them away from developing their hardware, you create another set of problems. So co-location helps if you really are truly co-located as a team. We, we wouldn't have been. Uh, we the top level of the, of the org chart would have been co-located. The, the, the implementation folks, the engineers doing the work, the people making it would not have been co-located. And to me, that was, that, was a, that was a bigger disadvantage than the advantage of doing the co-location. Even though there's a tremendous synergy for co-location, um, that was just too hard to go do. So if we, if we had manufacturing where we had more typical vendors or it was a private company and so-and-so and we had a, a resident office there and they can keep tabs on them, then a co-location approach may have been a little better. Um, but when we had actual civil servants making hardware in their location, we needed those people to stay where they are. Separately, it's very expensive to do co-location, and, and cost is always a, is, is a factor. So was it worth bringing these people say, hey, you're going to live in – Huntsville or, or KSC or, or, or Langley for the next you know six months or a year, um, that was something that we were just weren't ready to, 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 to bite off and chew. Now the, the reason we know co-location works is at the end we were essentially co-located. All the pieces were physically built. They were all shipped to KSC. The last two months or so, all the principals were at KSC. Now my management team moved there. Uh, IPTs were, were there for extended you know duration. They brought their engineering staffs with them. And by doing that, the amount of communication and the speed at solving problems was just amazing. You know, we just worked, you know, whenever we needed to, problems were solved within minutes or hours compared to weeks or days. So that co-locating when it comes to problem solving, when it comes to real-time, you know, problems on the floor, that was ideal. And, and we, we really did a superb job of having the right folks at Kennedy Space Center at the right time to solve all those problems. One of the, um, the after-the-fact thoughts was that worked out really well. Um, maybe up front, what we could have done is kind of a hybrid is pulled some of those management folks at the very beginning and spend three weeks or two months or some amount of time making sure we understand all the requirements traceability, understand the configuration management system, and understand all the um, all the, the, the top-level design issues before we're manufacturing but up front in our formulation phase, then co-locate people, then we'll get in the right mindset. We'll get past these lingo discussions. We'll understand kind of uh, cultural or center biases and, and preferences. Then after that, then disperse people back to the center to start building their stuff. So if you look at a, uh, if, at a, at a project life cycle of like a pre-phase A or a formulation stage, then a design phase and a manufacturing stage and operations phase, that formulation stage would be key to get as many people physically together in the same room. And once you get closer to manufacturing and closer to complete, completing, I mean, once you get closer to the, the actual design phase, then you probably need to get people closer to where their hardware is being built to go do it that way. There is a definite uh, advantage to having the people that have the authority to make decisions together. I mean, there's face-to-face -face communication benefits that are very, you know, they're worth a lot. And what we had done is tried to <clears throat> have a daily um meeting with responsible, authoritative people from each IPT. And we actually, our plans were to house them, as far as an office space, all in the same area, where there's a synergy of just being around each other, the daily activities of being able to just understand what, you, what each other is actually having to, uh, having to deal with. And by putting those people together on an almost constant basis, there, there is advantage. And by saying you're going to talk together every day at a certain time, we tried that. It, it, it was some hybrid of that, but I believe where it lacked was the fact that it was not 
a continuous stream. The same people weren't continuous. People, because this was from other centers, they have lives, they have families, they had to go back. So um, the fact that we weren't in one big bullpen together made that transition a little more difficult. When Jim was here for two weeks, everybody got to know who Jim was, what Jim was doing, how he operated, everybody got that. But then when, you know, John shows up, there, there was a learning curve to get to know him, where if, if they were all in the same room, that learning curve would be a lot quicker because you'd be immersed with each other. But the way it was is that we kind of went our separate ways and directions and came together. Um, so while I know that sounds like putting people in a bullpen, I think that the bullpen for certain key group is important to have. One of the things that made Aries 1X uh, a real challenge but which at the end of the day constituted a huge success for it, was the geographically distributed virtual mission team that it was. Operating with those, those five centers in that virtual uh, project environment was very much a challenge. So, for example, when Bob would chair his uh, XCB, his uh, Aries 1X control board on Tuesday mornings, that was done virtually, so we had a WebEx and a Telecon. Uh, and similarly, all of the sub-tier uh, boards and panels that worked uh, the different issues uh, in both the safety and the chief engineering and the system engineering chain, because there was really three supporting technical uh, chains of command that would uh, come into, feed data into uh, the XCB. Uh, all of those meetings were held virtually via telecon and WebEx. Um, and that, uh, that, you know, it's a challenge. You're not there in the same meeting room. It's hard to read individuals' body language. Uh, the loud personalities on the phone call can dominate the conversation. We got into kind of the, the meat of the preliminary design, the critical design, and then the manufacturing of the hardware uh, at the centers and with our, our contractors. Uh, the meetings tended to be more of a bilateral or trilateral nature. So uh, the SCNI folks would have meetings associated with integrated vehicle performance and integrated design analysis and system level, uh, vehicle level requirements development and verification. So we would go to Langley and or a subset of our team, you know, would go to Langley uh, and have those particular meetings uh, focused on, on, on those disciplines. Uh, and if we were working in interface, uh, so for example, the, the upper stage simulator was a particularly challenging element from the standpoint that we shared an interface, at a minimum a hardware interface, and in most cases an electrical and a fluid uh, interface as well, uh, with every other element uh, both on the launch vehicle as well as the ground system. And so we had to go have those bilateral discussions one-on-one uh, -on -one around each of those interfaces. So, for example, uh, we had meetings uh, with the first stage folks that were out at ATK in Utah, uh, a couple uh, early meetings that we had to try to nail down the requirements at that interface, our upper stage to first stage interface, and so on and so forth with the other elements that we shared interfaces with. As we got into the launch campaign and started delivering hardware to uh, the Cape and building up the vehicle uh, in the vehicle assembly building, uh, each IPT sent a cadre, a subset of its team, uh, down to Kennedy Space Center to be resident at KSC and work the hands-on uh, and really the fun tasks of physically integrating the vehicle and uh, then processing it for launch. We sent a team of 20 folks in November of 2008 uh, to KSC uh, to be there when our hardware arrived and uh, to then work uh, the receiving inspections as well as to finish up uh, some manufacturing tasks that we had not finished at Glenn Research Center uh, when we had to hit our ship window and uh, to then do the launch processing tasks that we had agreed to do uh, on behalf of the integrated team. Uh, and then as we turned over each of our, what we call the super segments, there were five super segments that we had stacked the 11 segments of the USS up into, 
We went through a formal custody turnover review and we conducted that there in the vehicle assembly building uh, with our KSC counterparts and uh, other uh, folks from the mission team present and uh, did a formal review to turn over custody from the USS team to the ground ops team at KSC. Uh, so from that point forward, as we completed our custody turnovers then, uh, we scaled down our presence uh, to on the order of uh, six or so folks and then uh, we always had at least one person, typically two, uh, resident at KSC uh, full time uh, from, you know, from the point of custody turnover right up through launch so that we could ensure that we had a presence on the, on the floor in the VAB and then out at the pad uh, in case any questions, issues, or problems came up uh, in processing the hardware uh, after we had turned it over to the ground ops IPT. And uh, certainly those issues did come up and, and then we would send additional folks down on a TDY basis to address them and resolve them. In every case, what I found was that uh, getting the people together face to face to talk through what their issues were, uh, what their concerns or disagreements were around the requirements or the process that was, uh, you know, was being levied on the operation, uh, that we could, in every case, successfully resolve, find a, uh, an appropriate compromise, uh, and then proceed forward. One of the things that, uh, that my personal experience during uh, the time at, uh, of, of processing the USS hardware at KSC uh, re-emphasized for me was something that I had learned very early in my career when I started my career at, at, uh, as a NASA system engineer at Kennedy Space Center. And that was that you know, when you heard that there had been a problem with the hardware or something had broken or, hey, we've got an issue that's going to delay the launch, the closer you got to the actual hardware itself, and I'm talking about going out onto the high bay floor, climbing into the super segment, and inspecting it with your very own eyes, you know, the closer you got to the hardware, kind of the truer the story became. And so uh, the, there's, no, there's just no um, shortcut for having a presence at the launch site, being close to the hardware, and having the ability to go out and, and walk out, walk it down, and inspect it with uh, with your very own eyes, and with the uh, with the team, uh, the stakeholders who are involved in trying to resolve that issue, uh, you can get to to the answer much faster, and you can usually get the issue resolved uh, very quickly by by being able to be out there with the hardware. Another another lesson that that was valuable for us for first stage was we made a decision early on that we needed to have a presence in our various facilities. Uh, we've got a resident office at ATK and Promontory and they helped us a lot. Uh, one of our major subs, one of ATK's major subs was, was uh, Major Tool and Machine in Indianapolis. They provided the Frustum, Fort Skirt, Fort Skirt Extension, Fissima Simulator, all that hardware. Uh, we decided early on that, that we needed to have our people in their facility. ATK had their people there anyway, but we, it, we felt a lot better about putting, about putting people from, from our team, the first stage team there as well. Worked out really well. Obviously, at, uh, and we'd planned to do this all along, uh, but once we got hardware in Florida, you know, six months or so prior to launch, you know, we had a we had a presence there all the time. We rotated people out of our office here in Huntsville to Florida, two, three, sometimes four weeks at a time, um, and you know, we essentially took turns. And it, it wasn't always just one person there. Sometimes it would be two, depending on the, the processing in place. So. That proved very valuable too, is just as far as communication. Co-location uh, at all levels to me benefited. I could see a great benefit when it occurred. Uh, for CM Last, took me six months to get a team office space. Once I had that, I could see our efficiency go up enormously. Having everybody together that you could work with together you had a question, you turned around and asked them instead of having to wait until you could get them on the phone or drive across the field was great. Um, one of the driving reasons for where I asked for was it was the same building as systems engineering and integration office. And as they had oversight over the entire vehicle and my primary uh, requirements were with the interfaces that they they oversaw, that was great benefit for me. Not only could I talk straight to my interfaces, but I could go to SE&I and 
see what it was they were looking for as well. And if one of us were missing what they were looking for, either us or our interface, we could help out with that too. And then once we got down to Kennedy, all the co-location of all the different IPTs, and then starting to interface with ground ops and ground systems there, uh, things really started rolling once we got there. One, one thing that helped me um, as the management team, and presumably it helped the team, but one thing to me was you know, I live here in Houston. When this started off and most of the integration work was done at Langley, I moved to Langley. And, and, and I did that so I can be new, near most of the folks doing the integration part of it. And so your project manager and your integration folks need to be you know, tied at the hip because they're really implementing the decisions that you make from the integration point of view. And it was too difficult for me to do that from Houston and being remote. So I moved to Langley for a year and a half to, to really be with those guys you know, day to day, side by side, so we could understand each other, didn't talk past each other very often because we were, we were together. And that really helped me understand what was important to them, what was driving the overall integration, what their challenges were, but also to put things in a way that they could actually understand based on their background and, and go do. And once all the hardware got to KSC, you know, moved to, I moved to Florida for a while, for nine months. And then since I was there every day, I wasn't just visiting for a couple of weeks and back home for a couple of weeks. People would know where I sat. People would drop by. They'd have questions or concerns. Um, I was on the floor two or three times a day. I walked through all our processing. But physically being there as a manager, it's very much the management by walking around. By doing that just over and over again and over and over again, you know, people would, would, would come up to me, technicians would say, hey, you know, I'm worried about this. You know, how come we're doing this? And, uh, you know, I'd tell them whatever, whatever I knew. But having the, the, the connection with the folks doing the work on the floor um, is something I wouldn't have got if, if I was just visiting every couple of weeks. But being there, and I can come at midnight if I needed to, I can come at 2 in the morning if I needed to, um, and I'd see them in the weekend when they were working, I'd come in, and just by getting that relationship and being able to be there so often, I think helped uh, speed any kind of issues that were bubbling up. I would often hear about them before other folks because I, you know, I was there uh, on the floor where they were back in Huntsville or they were back in, in Virginia. And when you're there and you see it happening, you understand the context of it, and you know whether to worry more so about it or less, as opposed to reading it on a chart the next day or hearing from a telecon. So... For me to co-locate to, to what I consider the, the, the key areas of, uh, of, of effort. So during the formulation man, you know, design phase, the integration part of it was really key. That was the key to the whole project and the biggest challenge. So moving to Virginia was important. When putting the vehicle together, that really was where our energy was focused. So being there where the hardware was was not enabling for me. So other, uh, I think other project managers should consider where is the center of gravity of, of their project. And is it in their center? Is it at a, if it's at a contractor's facility? Is it at the operations center? And, and find a way to get close to that and really close to the point that you, you forge relationships with those people. And I think you'll have a much better understanding of what's really happening with your project if you do it that way. If you are trying to do a, um, an important job like this, uh, another flight test or even something of, uh, of a different science or, or aerospace nature, I think co-location cannot be underestimated. Um, a number of us moved down to Florida for the last eight or nine months of the mission, which was terrific. Personally, I believe that we needed to have more face-to-face uh, -face time ahead of time. Now, I understand that there's complexities. My wife works. My kids are in school. I understand what all this means. But the co-location greatly facilitates the communication. Having said that, when a diversified team like we had, we had a, basically a virtual uh, management team that talked all the time and we personally got along very well some of my closest friends are people that I've learned uh, met on this project uh, and so that helped quite a bit but the co-location in my book is a very very important thing had we done it earlier I would I believe that as good as we did we could have uh, gotten through some things a little quicker had we all been located in the in the same area and maybe that co-location would take the form of maybe three weeks together or four weeks together at a certain time and then uh, going back to our offices or our homes and then going back but um, when we got down to the Cape most of us moved to the Cape for the last eight or nine months that made a huge difference as we stepped through the uh, integration and testing early on it would have been good too when we were doing requirements and performance analysis